This is Audible. Two Tales of the Iron Druid Chronicles Written by Kevin Hearn Performed by Luke Daniels Author's Note Kaibab Unbound is the first short story I ever wrote. It was intended as an introductory piece to Atticus and Oberon, not only to show their relationship, but to show what Atticus is supposed to be doing with his druidic powers outside the Angus Og Tuatha Dé Danann storyline of the novels. Chronologically, it's set just a few weeks before the events of Hounded. A Test of Metal is a companion piece to Hammered, giving us our first good look at Granuel as a narrator and filling in some more background on the training program for druids. It takes place while Atticus is off in Asgard, and the events of this story are alluded to in the fourth book of the series, Tricked. Many thanks to illustrator Galen Dara for the beautiful cover. And many, many thanks to you for reading or listening. Cheers! Kaibab Unbound If I had died when I was supposed to, I would have missed out on all the fun. I never would have played around with an iPad, iPhone, or i-anything. And all the e-stuff, like emails and e-harmony, would have been as impossible for me to imagine as a troll-free internet is today. I would have missed out on ineffable masterpieces like Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, Beethoven's Ode to Joy, and Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And toilet paper. Let me tell you. People go on and on about what a great idea electricity was, but I'm going to put toilet paper right next to the wheel and say those are the best ideas anyone's ever had. Scoff at it if you will, but try living for two millennia without it, and then we'll talk. The dawn of modern civilization was largely cold, wretched, and smelled bad, and the best that can be said about it is that it's in the past. Once I got past my fifth century, it was the little things that made life worth living for such a long time. It's the little things that keep me grounded in the present and loving it, like hunting with my hound Oberon. We do the kind of hunting where you really don't care if you find what you're hunting for, because, in truth, you just want to spend time in nature with your friend. We were driving together to the Kaibab Plateau, a unique ecosystem north of the Grand Canyon, in a gas zipper I'd rented for the purpose. It's good to get out of town, Atticus, Oberon said, his words filtering into my mind through the special bond we shared. It's not the kind of bond I'd form with just any creature. For one thing, it's a lot of work, and not all creatures are as smart as Oberon, or even willing to talk about anything except food and sex. But once in a while, it's worth it, to slow down and see the threads connecting all living things to the earth, to take up the threads of this horse or that bear, bind them for a short time with my own, and see the world from their perspective. With Oberon, I'd made the binding much stronger, so that he absorbed my language over time, and I didn't have to think in pictures and emotions with him. His head was thrust out of the window now, and his tongue flapped on the side of his face. The air is so much cleaner up north. Couldn't agree with you more, I replied. Why don't we do it more often? he asked. I struggled to come up with a simple answer that wouldn't make him worry. The truth is, I should have died before Jesus walked the earth. And one Irish god, Angus Og, still wanted me dead for getting the better of him two millennia ago. He had all sorts of fae scouring the earth looking for me, and I can't spend too much time in the forests, because I invariably leave traces. Ridiculously happy trees, basically, since I'm the last druid in the world and they tend to geek out when I show up. That means I have to hide out in cities. The fae don't like to visit places full of iron, and Arizona in particular is nice because the Phoenix metro area is a vast, sprawling city that the fae find revolting. It's not that they can't handle walking around in an urban area. It's more that they're lazy and can't get in and out of Phoenix quickly. They travel via oak, ash, and thorn, and there's only a couple of places in the state, far from the city, where they grow together. Staying in town was simply safer for me, 
But Oberon didn't know anything about my old troubles yet, and I had no reason to burden him with them now. I settled on a pedestrian excuse instead. Well, there's the shop to run. I have people who depend on me to make their tea. I run a New Age bookstore in Tempe, near Arizona State University, and in one corner of the store I sell bulk herbs as an apothecary and brew some proprietary medicinal teas that my customers find simply miraculous. I have a group of regulars who come in every day for a shot of mobility, a blend that relieves their arthritis and makes them feel springy and bouncy and ten years younger. There's nothing especially miraculous about it, nor is there anything mysterious about most of my teas. It's just that I have twenty-one hundred years of experience as an herbalist, so I know a wee bit about drug interactions. You told me once most of your teas don't involve magic, Oberon said. So that means you could make them ahead of time and just have your employees sell them while we're off hunting somewhere. You're a pretty smart dog. Damn Skippy. But I only have one employee right now. He's doing me a huge favor working these two days while we're gone. So hire more, Radicus. Everybody wants to work because they all have nice dogs to buy steaks for. And that's your cat people. And then they have kitty litter to buy. Hey, are those trees right there, Ponderosas? Yes, they are. We were driving north on I-17 through Munns Park. The Coconino National Forest shrugged off the scrub oaks and alligator junipers in that area and started to assert itself with some taller trees. They look like a whole lot of fun to run through. Bet you there's a deer just over the next hill. Irish wolfhounds like Oberon were originally bred to hunt down wolves and deer. They were so good at it that Ireland doesn't have any more of either. Yeah, but that's all private property, I pointed out. We have to play in the National Forest. There'll be ponderosas there, too, and some stands of aspen. Are we driving nonstop? No, we're going to stop in Flagstaff. Ah, no! You're taking us to that vegetarian place, aren't you? It's a coffee place. You can't just automatically classify anything that isn't a steakhouse as vegetarian. Yes, I can. This is America. You said Americans assert their own opinions as if they were facts, and dismiss inconvenient facts as mere opinions. Sometimes Oberon doesn't process anything, I say, and sometimes he listens to me a bit too well. We may be in America, but you're not an American. You're the hound of the last druid in the world. I'm not going to allow you to get away with sloppy logic. Oh, it's not fair of you to hold me to a higher standard than any human in this country. Yes, it is. I feed you sausage and steak instead of dry kibble, so I'm entitled to elevated conversation. We wrangled happily over my high expectations until we reached Flagstaff. I promptly steered my way to Beaver Street, just south of the railroad tracks, where sits Macy's European Coffee House. It's a wee place that roasts its own coffee and makes all their pastries from scratch. They have metal picnic tables outside painted forest green, and there's a large utility pole papered over with concert posters and flyers for seminars and visiting Asian mystics. Friendly dogs are routinely hitched to the pole or the tables and get petted by everyone going in and out. I tied over onto the pole to keep people from freaking out and told him to try to look docile. He has to make a special effort since he's such a huge dog. But wagging his tail and letting his tongue loll out tends to work fairly well. Hurry up, please, he said. I always feel so stupid when you're not around. People either make weird noises or talk to me like I'm an idiot, and I can't tell them to cut it out. I promised him I would hurry and step through the door into the most marvelous aroma. Arabica beans and fresh-baked bread. Macy's always smelled good like that. Its regular customers live on the political left, and they dress like it, wearing cotton, hemp, and wool, thickets of untamed facial hair, and hats of all kinds, except for baseball caps. 
Framed watercolors from local artists line the walls, and their menu of sandwiches is scrawled on a chalkboard. The employee dress code seems to be show up with clothes on, but they also eschew restrictions on visibly inked skin and facial piercings that many other restaurants enforce. Macy's is one of my favorite places to watch people. Half of the customers are self-conscious members of the intelligentsia from Northern Arizona University. Much of the rest are making a point of some kind. And then, once in a while, somebody comes in from the street without realizing what kind of place it is. It's genuinely shocking for such people to walk into a business that's so anti-corporate and independent. Their disorientation is plain as is their growing horror and guilt that they are the only person there wearing synthetic fibers. And it makes me smile. I also like to flip my vision to the magical spectrum and look at people's auras and see the blues and greens glowing with health and hopeful of becoming healthier. The people there are bound together. They do not know it or think of it as such, but it is true. The dirty rust of discontent stands out sorely in Macy's, or the dull gray of depression, or the angry reds of greed and materialism. The young woman at the front of the line when I walked in was a siren of angst and a sense of entitlement denied. She was a slender brunette with her hair tied in a ponytail, wearing a brown velour tracksuit trimmed in turquoise that hugged her shape. She had an aura that was roiling in reds and oranges, broadcasting that she was on a major power trip, and no one had better get in her way. To be generous, maybe she was just having a bad day. But she was kind of killing my groovy hippie buzz, and I couldn't wait for her to leave so I could surf the spiffy vibe generated by a room full of iconoclasts, secure in their identities. As she picked up her order, three coffees to go, and passed me on her way out, I noticed a telltale ripple playing about the wisps of her hair, a buzz of white interference that said this woman had practiced magic successfully. I almost pulled a shaggy on the spot. Zoinks! Like run, Scoob! It's a witch! Given the rest of her aura, she probably hadn't chosen Glinda the Good as her role model. She looked more of the double-double toil-and-trouble type, and the three coffees took on more significance. She might be the maiden in one of those maiden-mother-crone covens. Witches who radiate that kind of aggression generally don't get along with me. Druids look at the tapestry of nature and try to make sure the weave of it remains strong reinforcing the binding between all living things and sewing up the threads on the edges that fray and unravel. Benevolent witches do nothing to harm that and often try to help. Witches with auras like hers, on the other hand, often punch holes in the tapestry in the pursuit of personal power, making deals with dark supernatural forces that want nothing more than to see nature perverted and destroyed. Since I'm the only real druid left, such witches are getting away with a lot more than they used to, and I confess that seeing the havoc they wreak tends to make me consider them all guilty until proven innocent, though I realize that's not very fair of me. This particular witch couldn't read auras very well, if at all, or she would have shown some sign as she passed me. Aura readers always give me a double take, because mine doesn't match the younger ginger lad that I look like. Hey, Oberon, there's a young woman coming out with three coffees who's pretty weird, I called in my mind. See what you can smell on her. Am I allowed to sniff her ass? Definitely not. You don't want to do that. All right, but the ass tells you everything you need to know about a person. It's like that Rosetta Stone you were telling me about. Oh, oh that must be her. There was a pause, and then he continued. Mm, yeah, I couldn't get a really good whiff since I'm tied up, and that coffee is pretty strong. But she smells like fabric softener, lavender soap, and a, a bunch of stuff from out of your shop. I beg your pardon? What stuff from my shop? You know, the plant stuff. Which plants? I don't know. You haven't taught me their names. I'm not the druid here. I'm just a druid's hound. 
and a most excellent hound you are. I appreciate your help. Can you tell me if the plants you smelled were floral and sweet-smelling, or perhaps bitter, maybe earthy? Earthy. Nothing sweet, but nothing nasty either. That told me she wasn't into love potions, and she wasn't into sicking demons on people, or sending plagues and agues either. It meant she probably wasn't up to anything too dangerous at the moment, and I could ignore her safely. Thank you, Oberon. That's very interesting. You just earned yourself a sausage. Score! That one brought worse, but no crowd of mustard this time. I don't care if it's Oktoberfest. You just ruin meat when you put pickled cabbage on it. It's a deal. I'll be out soon. The line's moving. Once I got to the counter, I bought a blue handmade ceramic mug and had the super crunchy barista, Zypop, fix my San Francisco cappuccino in it. Since I enjoyed saying her name so much, I asked her to get me a few more things. Zypop, do you still sell Cosmic Ray's Guide to Mountain Bike Trails? And wound up buying stuff I didn't need. She even sold me some baked vegan dog biscuits, which I purchased gleefully as a joke. I'd wait for Oberon to choke a couple down. Then I'd tell him they were meatless, and it was all Zypop's fault. I forgot about the Three Coffee Witch for ten whole minutes. Just before we left town to the east and the road curved north and turned to Highway 89, I saw her in the passenger seat of a maroon Honda Civic that was waiting for an opportunity to pull out of a gas station. That opportunity came right behind me, and I quickly checked out her companions in the rearview mirror to see if I'd been right about the maiden mother crone thing. I hadn't. Damn it, now I'm paranoid, I said aloud. That's not a new thing. You're always paranoid, Oberon observed. Plus, you talk to your dog and you believe in magic. By modern standards, you should be locked away and sucking down Thorazine in a tall icy glass with an umbrella in it. What? Where'd you hear about Thorazine? They were going to give some to Sarah Connor and Terminator 2 because she was paranoid like you. I need to get you some new movies to watch while I'm at work. I said, keeping one eye on the witch, or witches, in my mirror. The other two were just as young as the first one, just as attractive, and their auras were the same angry red, too. Except I couldn't discern in the mirror whether they had the thin sliver of white interference about their heads. It raised many questions in my mind. But Oberon derailed me temporarily from considering them. Can I watch something with ninjas in it? I don't want to watch any more romantic comedies. Or those teen angst flicks you like. I don't like them, I said. I watch them for research, so that I can figure out how these people think and talk. It takes a lot of work to make people think I grew up here, you know. I should make you watch Jane Austen dramas for a week, and then you'll be begging me to bring back Juno. I don't know who Jane Austen is, but I'm sure she's sensible enough to worry about more important things than fingernails and Tic Tacs. You want sensible? Fine. Sense and sensibility it is. We'll see how you like it. I return my attention to the rearview mirror. Three young women raised unsettling possibilities when I couldn't see their aura as well. It was possible, even likely that the other two were simply sorority sisters of Coffee Witch, as I'd come to think of her, and not witches themselves. But since they had almost identical auras to Coffee Witch, and they were also wearing velour tracksuits, it suggested to me a unity of purpose for which covens are known. The driver was blonde and had a pink suit on and dark sunglasses. I call her Pinky. She had really thin lips, and she was flapping them in an irritated manner, arguing about something with one or both of her passengers. In the back seat on the passenger side sat another brunette with a deep tan in a royal blue tracksuit. I named her Coppertone, and she was leaning forward to better hear what Pinky had to say, a frown on her face. I really hoped I wasn't looking at a coven of young witches. With auras like that, and the illusion of invincibility that all young people have, they were liable to try something immensely stupid. In Maiden Mother Crone Covens, the mother figure tends to balance out the other two. 
The maiden says, Hell, let's do some unspeakable shit, because I'm strong, and I'll survive the consequences if things go wrong. And the crone says, Why not? Let's do some unspeakable shit, because I'm gonna die soon anyway. But the mother usually says, Let's all chill out and think about this. Hedge our bets and play it safe. Whatever their argument was, they subsided after a while and drove in silence behind me all the way onto the plateau. It actually made me nervous. Were they following me for some reason? Or was this just a coincidence? That they spotted my aura after all, and now they wanted to find out exactly why the guy who looked twenty-one had an energy signature of extreme maturity and magical power? The few people in Tempe who know what I really am have secrets of their own to keep, so I didn't think they'd tell anyone, much less these youngsters, that I'm older than Jesus. But you never know. Seems like everyone wants the secret of eternal youth, and they're willing to do most anything to lay hold of it. Maybe somebody suggested to these ladies that I had the answer. Or maybe their trip was nothing more than what it appeared to be. Three college girls taking a trip to the north rim of the Grand Canyon. I took Highway 67 for a short stretch south of Highway 89, then cut west on Forest Service Road 461 towards Jacob Lake. At that point, I finally lost my tail. I took FSR 282 south, skirting Jacob Lake, and continuing down a sinuous dirt track for several miles— while Coffee Witch and company continued on 461, presumably to visit the inn above the lake. I relaxed and pushed them out of my mind. They were doubtless going there for a slice of the famous pie before they drove down to the north rim. I pulled off to the side of the road and parked once we got to a densely forested area. I sucked in a lungful of early autumn air and admired the trees before me. Mostly old-growth ponderosa, with a few mixed conifers here and there. It would give way to white fingers of aspen at higher elevations. After I let Oberon out, I kicked off my sandals and sent a greeting to the earth through my knotted tattoos, which were much more than personal decoration. They were the visual evidence of my magical bond to the earth. The indigo knot work began, if Celtic knots can be said to begin anywhere— on the back of my right hand, then the threads of it traveled up my arm, circled beneath my shoulder, and down my right side all the way to the sole of my foot. While in contact with the earth, I had all its power on tap if I needed it, for as I am bound to the earth, it is bound to me. Talking to the earth is tricky, because it doesn't follow the syntax of human language, and it works in geological time. If I want to commune directly with Gaia, it takes a deep trance and about a week to say hello. What I do instead is speak to her proxies, the elementals that dwell in a defined ecosystem. It's akin to talking to a worker bee instead of the queen, since the queen is rarely available and the bee, in this case, can speak for her. The speaking itself is not speaking at all. It's more like pheromone emissions containing my emotions, bundled into nouns and verbs, though that explanation doesn't really cover it, and it leeches away a good deal of the fun. It's simpler to just call it druidry, the magic of binding the natural world. It's tough to render such communication into mere words, but here's an approximation of what I sent to the local elemental. Druid greets Kaibab. Health. Harmony. Query. Hunt. The response thrums quickly through my tattoos. Kaibab greets Druid. Welcome. Rest. Hunt. Nourish self. Harmony. You don't know what warm fuzzies are until you get personally welcomed to a forest by its avatar. Gratitude. Contentment. Harmony. I replied. Come on, Yadikis, Oberon said, his tail wagging as he spun in excited circles. Run with me through the trees. He didn't have to ask me twice. I shucked off my clothes and put them in the trunk. Then I hid the car's keys inside the front tire well. Remaining on all fours, I triggered the transformation into a wolfhound and sneezed. 
because the abrupt ability to smell fifty times better can do that to a fella. I can bind myself to four different animal shapes, but when I'm a hound, I have a thick red coat with dark markings on my right side where my tattoos are. We lit out into the woods with gusto, a red dog and a gray dog, friends in the forest, padding across a carpet of needles and drinking in the crisper scent of pine. We caught the scent of the kaibab deer herd after about a half mile, and we split up. I drove a three-point buck south to Oberon, and he pounced on him successfully and brought him down. I'm not a huge fan of raw venison, even in hound form, so I let Oberon go to it and found a nice spot in a meadow to sun myself some distance away. I was rolling around on my back, enjoying the smell and tickle of the grass, the sound of my own playful thrashing, when terror and loathing seized me. Kaibab needs druid. Jacob Lake, help! Discord! The air rushed out of my lungs, and all sound stopped, as if there were a temporary vacuum. The chirps of bird and hum of insects, the wind whispering in the trees, all of it was gone. The sounds came back tentatively after a few seconds, but a deeper silence remained. Query, Kaibab! I got no answer, not even to repeated calls. Worry clenched at my heart. Had I become unbound from the earth? Unbound from my friend? I tried something else. Oberon, can you hear me? Of course, he said, and I sighed in relief. My ears just popped or something. Did you feel that, whatever it was? Yes. I need you in the meadow to the east. Okay. I've had my fill anyway. What's up? There's trouble at Jacob Lake coffee witch came immediately to mind, but I had no idea what she and her friends could have done to upset Kaibab. Can you find your way there by getting back to the road and following it north? Sure, but aren't you coming with me? I'm gonna fly there. I unloosed the knot that bound me to hound form and tied myself to a different shape, this time a great horned owl. Look for me nearby or wait by the lakeshore if you don't see me. Are you gonna kick somebody's ass? I don't know. Maybe. Oberon trotted into the meadow as I leapt into the air, flapping hard to gain altitude. Well, I'm not gonna worry. I've watched you spar with that martial arts dummy in the backyard lots of times. And you always win. Thanks, buddy. I'll see you soon. I circled around to the north and tried to gain speed. Owls are more renowned for their silence than their swiftness, but I still figured it was the fastest way for me to get back to Jacob Lake, and if there was trouble there, then a silent approach would serve me well. Jacob Lake is actually a dissolution sinkhole formed in the limestone of the plateau. It's been there for ages, and it's the main watering hole for wild animals in the area. A large meadow surrounds it, and further back the ponderosas and aspens give it a majestic skyline. There's also a tiny village by the same name a bit to the north, where the inn was located, so I didn't know if the trouble was by the actual lake or in town. I floated just above the tops of the trees so that I wouldn't waste any time in maneuvers, taking the straightest line to the lake. Once in range of the meadow and the lake in the center of it, I spied nothing but a dozen wild horses munching on the last grasses of the season. I thought a circuit of the lake would be prudent, so I began to circle it counterclockwise, staying above the trees and looking below. Once I got around to the west side, nine o'clock in dogfighters' terms, I saw a flash of pale flesh below the canopy, and I banked around to take a better look. I heard odd screeching noises, too, and then tense voices. I don't think you should kill it, because that'll be like releasing it. It can't break the circle, even if it escapes the animal. It'll still be bound. Fine, but how do we get its power into us? I don't know. I didn't expect this half-assed splicing of spells to work. So you didn't even plan for the eventuality? The voices belonged to three familiar women, who were all witches beyond a doubt now. They were clustered naked around something on the ground, and I decided to perch in a pine tree behind them to take stock of the situation and prevent them from seeing me accidentally. What little noise I made upon landing was masked, no doubt, by the frantic animal cries coming from the vicinity of the women. Their bodies were blocking whatever was making the cries. 
The women were easy to tell apart even without their tracksuits on. Coffee was on the left, pale with an occasional dark freckle, and her hair still tied in a ponytail. The blonde, thin-lipped one I called Pinky was in the center, and Coppertone stood on the right, tanned all over, I noticed. None of them had neglected to visit the gym regularly. No, I didn't, said Pinky with some asperity. And neither did either of you, so you can aim that blame somewhere else. Well, we have to try something, said Coffee. Don't you think I know that? Pinky snapped. Though I thought I knew what was going on, I couldn't quite believe that they had managed it. I needed to know more before I leapt to any conclusions. I glided silently to the earth and released myself from the owl shape back to my human form again. I quietly cast camouflage on myself, which is the nearest I can come to invisibility. It binds my pigment to my surroundings, so that I become practically invisible when I remain still. People can see me if I move quickly, but if I imitate the Rock of Gibraltar, they have to really know I'm there to spot me. I figured it was best. Naked women rarely welcome the approach of strange naked men, except in porn movies. Tiptoeing around to the left of the trio, my suspicions were confirmed. Somehow this coven of callow witches had succeeded in capturing and binding a forest elemental. A small metal cage was fairly bouncing on the forest floor, and inside was a frenzied kaibab squirrel in the most exquisite pain, because it was trying to contain the spirit of the entire forest in its wee little body. Kaibab squirrels are unique to the plateau, with fluffy white tails and tufted black ears that look like tassels. They evolved there in geographic isolation and occupy a vital ecological niche. They're the face of the plateau in many ways, but they aren't constitutionally capable of holding an elemental inside of them. I think the only reason it was still alive was because the elemental really wanted it that way. The squirrel's fur rippled and its eyes bulged. It twitched and spasmed and chittered in terror, and I felt sorry for it. And angry. I looked around to see if I could discern how they had managed this. There wasn't an obvious cauldron hanging over a fire with an unholy stench bubbling forth. There wasn't a stone altar with a sacrifice on it, bleeding its life away. They had to have used some mechanism to bind Kaibab. They could not have simply bid him to come and take up residence in a squirrel. Finally, I spotted it. Carved carefully into the bark of the ponderosa behind the stone circle was the Seal of Arielis, a pernicious seal from the seventh book of Moses, originally intended to bind one of the seven great princes of hell. Since its publication in 19th century Germany, witches of various stripes had been using it to bind all manner of spirits and compel their obedience. They'd found it to be one of the few fail-safes in magic. Either the spirit came and was firmly bound by the seal, or it didn't work, period, and all they lost was some time. These witches had traced the carving with crushed knotweed, a common herb used in binding spells, and the same seal was printed on a piece of parchment resting underneath the squirrel's cage. I sighed. You know, when that elemental gets out of there, I said, you're gonna wish you'd left well enough alone. Who said that? Coffee spun in my direction, but utterly failed to see me as I remained still. Pinky and Coppertone started looking around, even up in the trees, but they had no better luck than Coffee did. Where are you? Coppertone asked. Who are you? Pinky called. Who I am doesn't matter. What I am is a druid, and you've broken druidic law by binding an elemental against its will. They were all gazing directly at me now, because I'd helpfully given them a direction to look by speaking again. They still didn't see me, though. How does he know what we've done? Coppertone whispered. I thought the druids all died before Rome fell, Coffee said. All but one, I said. The Romans never found me. I still can't see him, Pinky complained in a frustrated whisper. Can't do anything. That told me they would have thrown some juju at me already, if they had line of sight. Show yourself, 
Coppertone shouted, taking a couple of steps in my direction. They weren't shy. They'd made no move at all to cover their nudity. I'm honestly sorry for you, I said over the pained cries of the squirrel. You obviously have some magical talent, and you might have turned out to be great witches. But I can't let you have Kaibab's power. It needs to be free. I still didn't know what kind of witches they were. The seal of Arielis was supposed to have been written down by Moses, if the editors of that grimoire were to be believed, and its purported Jewish origins led many to conclude that one must have Kabbalistic talents to use it safely. But I had grave doubts on that score. I knew that same seal had been successfully employed by priests of Vodun and Obi, and teenage girls who had found the damn thing on the internet. Whatever they were, they were clever enough to adapt the seal to their own purposes, and their purposes were not benign. We can't let him break the circle, Pinky said, stepping toward me with her arms groping the air. And then she switched to speaking Russian, no doubt thinking I wouldn't understand it. It would have been a good assumption if they were dealing with a young American guy, but they were dealing with a truly ancient Irish guy who spoke forty-two languages. Nam nujno oshtano vitigo, she said. We need to stop him. Coffee and Coppertone formed up on either side, searching with their hands for the source of my disembodied voice. Coppertone continued in the same language. We should cast a speed spell, smart girl. If they couldn't target me with their magic, they could target themselves and search for me more quickly. They switched languages again to something that sounded related to Russian, but which I couldn't follow. Maybe it was Old Church Slavonic. They spoke in concert and moved their right arms in a synchronized gesture, and afterwards their movements blurred with speed. Creepy. And evidence that they might be much more accomplished than I originally thought. They were probably much older than they looked, too. These were witches of the old world, come here to take on the power of the new. They advanced quickly on me, and if they got hold of me, they might turn out to be stronger than they looked. I didn't want to find out how powerful they were by experimentation. If they could bind Kaibab, they might have a way to bind me, too. Or they might tear me apart the way the Maynads did Orpheus. There were several things I could do to bind them, but all of it would take more time than the witches would allow, and speaking the words at this point would draw them closer to my position. If I tried to run around them, they'd spot the movement and hear my footfalls, and I'd be dealing with curses flung at my feet. The only solution was to knock them down and hope I had time to break Kaibab out of the circle. I let them get close, and then I sucker-punched them, and I'm not ashamed of it. People who try to fight fair with witches tend to die unfairly. Coffee and Pinky each took a fist in the nose, and as they were reeling backward, Coppertone swung a fist at the mirage of my camouflaged head. She was super fast, but not a trained martial artist. I had already dropped to the ground so that I could sweep her legs, and as she tumbled awkwardly to the forest floor, I chopped down hard just below her ribs, driving all the air out of her lungs. She gasped and clutched at her midsection. She wouldn't be casting any spells, or chasing me, until she got her breath back. Now that I'd established clearly in their minds that I had fists and knew how to use them, I changed my shape to make a break for the circle. I bound myself to the form of a sea otter, which I almost never take on land, and scampered directly towards Coffee and Pinky, who were trying to find me. They heard me coming, and they saw something moving near the forest floor as my camouflage tried to compensate for the changing surroundings. So they aimed a curse in my direction and let fly about three feet above my head, assuming that they'd hit me in the torso if I was in human form. I heard tree bark splintering behind me, and was glad they had missed. I darted right between Pinky's legs, proud of myself for not looking up, and leapt for the stone circle that bound Kaibab. The breath woofed out of me as I crashed into an invisible barrier like a bird into a sliding glass door. Yes, despite their bewilderment at successfully binding Kaibab, these witches were much better than I originally thought.
As I thrashed myself back onto my short legs and looked for a likely place to retreat and hold still, Coffee and Pinky realized I'd gotten behind them and charged the circle. They saw the shadows of my movement near the ground, and this time they just tried to tackle me. Pinky missed me entirely, but Coffee got a lucky hand wrapped around my tail. I whipped around and bit her with my sharp otter teeth, and she let go. Ah! What the— He's not human anymore! She exclaimed as I scurried away. What is he then? Pinky asked. She expressed no disbelief. She just coldly wanted to assess the new threat. I don't know, Coffee said as the two of them regained their feet and I ducked behind a ponderosa to the south of the circle. Something with fur and sharp teeth. I think I grabbed his tail. All right, keep your eyes on the ground and aim low, she said. The physical approach hadn't worked, so it was time for me to try something else. It risked getting slapped hard by a defensive ward of theirs, but I thought the odds were on my side. The witches were probably not expecting to run into other magic users out here, and had probably chosen the spot for its isolation. I switched back to my human form and dug my toes into the ground. I concentrated on the soil underneath the circle of rocks, and felt its substance through my bond to the earth. I heard the witches approaching on my six, but I couldn't let that distract me. I spoke an old Irish, the language used centuries ago in the ritual that bound me to the earth, and thus the language I used to work my magic on it. Tear away, I breathed, sending the command down through my tattoos, and upon my word the soil caved in, spilling the rocks in all directions as the earth shifted, breaking the circle. A loud whoomp and a shock wave of compressed air announced the escape of Kaibab from the circle. The witches cursed in Russian, clutched at their ears, and asked each other what happened. They looked back at the squirrel, and it appeared to be nothing but a normal, frightened rodent now. Coffee was the first to realize what happened. It escaped! While they were distracted, I moved slowly out from behind the tree so that I could see them well. Coppertone had recovered and joined them near the tumbled ring of stones. Pinky stamped her foot and balled her hands into fists. How'd he break the circle? Kaibab thanks, Druid. Freedom sweet. Binding unjust. Unbound now. Rage. Vengeance. Violence permitted. Make peace with your gods now, I warned the witches as pine needles began to stir and whirl around them clockwise. I don't think Kaibab is going to give you a trial of your peers. Now wait, Coffee protested in my direction as she eyed the shifting ground. We didn't think it would go this far. We never expected to succeed. But you hoped you would, I said, not buying her plea of innocence for a second. You tried to bind a force of nature and take its power for yourselves, and it turns out that it is the only thing you can possibly do that will allow an elemental to strike back. You can pollute a river clear-cut a forest, or cause multiple species to go extinct, and it will shrug and do nothing. Try to usurp its power just once, though, and you'll never get a second chance. Pinky turned back in my direction and pleaded past a rising whirl of pine needles. Spare us! If you're a real druid, then all you do is bind nature and use its power! No, that's only part of what I do. As the earth is bound to me, so I am bound to it, and I must answer when it calls. It called me here to set it free. Pinky was so focused on me that she seemed unaware that she was standing in the center of a very strange vortex. She looked like she was going to hurl a choice curse or two my way, targeting my voice to see if the curse would stick. But at that moment, the earth opened up beneath her feet and swallowed her whole, a swirling curtain of pine needles following her down before the crust collapsed shut, choking off her screams with finality. The other two witches' eyes bugged, and they took that as their cue to run, crying out for mercy as they fled the scene, heading for the meadow surrounding the lake on the theory that it would be safer than staying underneath the trees. Coppertone never made it out. Branches from the surrounding ponderosas swung down, whipping and tearing at her bare skin, 
and she fought back with Slavonic curses, exploding branches and shattering trunks of trees. It only enraged Kaibab further, though, and eventually the tip of a well-aimed branch pierced Coppertone through her eye and into her brain, silencing her curses forever. Coffee did make it out of the meadow in one piece. She quickly discovered, however, that she wasn't any safer in open space. Kaibab sent the animals of the forest after her as she hurriedly tried to draw a circle of protection for herself near the lake. In those animated movies for kids, the beautiful heroine starts singing in the forest and the animals gradually gather around her and sing along until they've practically created a utopia with the power of their golden-throated warbling. This was sort of like watching what would happen if Edgar Allan Poe were in charge of those sequences. Birds got there first, pouring out of the surrounding forest from all directions. Bluebirds, nuthatches, robins, crows, woodpeckers, even hummingbirds, and a golden eagle. All of them harried her and pecked at her head, preventing her from completing her circle and giving the larger animals time to arrive and do some real damage. She destroyed a number of them, but there were too many to deal with, and she got no respite. A coyote hurried into the meadow from the north, and a bobcat sprinted in from the east, apparently the only predators nearby. They nipped at her heels and legs and bloodied her, but she managed to kill them both before they could take her down. I was dismayed by that and took a few steps in her direction to help out, but then I saw it would be unnecessary. Their harassment, combined with the cacophony of the birds, had masked the charge of a magnificent bull elk from the south, who rammed full speed into her back and sent her flying a good twenty feet or so. The herd of wild horses I'd seen grazing by the lake earlier followed up from the same direction. They mercilessly finished her off, trampling her to death in a mess of blood and mud on their hooves. Druid help! Release, small one! Gratitude, Kaibab said through the earth, and I picked my way past the tumbled stone circle to retrieve the metal cage. I carried the Kaibab squirrel to the nearest unscarred pine tree and opened the cage door near its base. It scampered out and straight up the tree's trunk, no worse off than it had been when it woke that morning, though it would probably have nightmares when it hibernated. Gratitude, justice, harmony. Kaibab said. The forest animals were gathered at the edge of the meadow, looking at me in silence. Once I'd turned to face them, they bobbed their heads at me once, before Kaibab released them to fly or gallop away in whatever direction they chose. Relief. Welcome, I replied. I set down the cage and tied myself to a hound's form once more then spent some time snuffling around the area where the witches had bound Kaibab. I found their velour tracksuits folded neatly nearby, and I dug a hole and buried them in it, but didn't try too hard to conceal the disturbed earth. Some bags of herbs were there, too, but I carried them off much further and did a better job of burying them, along with the seal of Arielis that had rested underneath the squirrel's cage. Before I left for good, I lifted my leg on the seal carved into the ponderosas, ruining the smeared knotweed and dissolving for good any remnants of magical power it held. The police, when they eventually came, would have a merry old time trying to reconstruct this crime scene. My work finished, I extended my legs into the ground-eating lope for which wolfhounds are celebrated, across the bloody meadow to the forest road, where I headed south. I met Oberon several minutes later, trotting up to find me. So what was all the trouble about? He asked. Had to help out a trapped squirrel is all, I said. That's it? That's why you flew off like you had to defend a base from Imperial walkers? Well, that's the short version, but yeah. Your priorities are all messed up, Atticus. Damned if I'd ever haul off like that to help a squirrel. I'm not ever gonna run like you did unless there's a porterhouse waiting for me at the other end. 
Well, we can take our time heading back to the car. Everything's fine now. I guess it is in the land of squirrels, but I don't know if I feel too comfortable here. You know, my ears popped again just a while ago, and I thought I heard somebody screaming, and a bunch of birds and horses going nuts. This forest is kind of spooky. Really? I don't think so, I said. To me, it's perfectly natural.